Y'all can have a seat. All right. So again, I want to make it really clear that what we're talking about over the next few weeks is a really, really important issue. I mean, it's a, it's a really big deal. Um, this isn't just like a fun little talk where we get together uh, to talk about our phones and have a good time and watch TikTok videos. Your, your phones have the potential to do a lot of good. They can be used for a lot of good, and they can be used for a lot of harm. They can. But the only way that they're going to be used for a lot of good is if you are very intentional, if you have a plan, if you have a vision for how it's going to take place without vision, the people perish. You need to have a purpose. There needs to be a meaning as to why you're doing the things you're doing on your phone. It's massive. And if you just go with the flow and if there's no purpose and if you're like, you know, I'm not really thinking about it. I'm just doing what everybody else does. It's going to be used for harm. It's going to harm your soul. It's going to harm your life. It could potentially harm your relationships with others. We're going to talk about some of that tonight. And it's a really big deal. Anything that's powerful, which this little, little thing is really powerful. It can be used for good and it can be used for harm. And it's up to you. And so really kind of the thesis question, I guess, if there's such a thing for the next three weeks is this. Do you control your phone? Do you control your phone intentionally? Like, like, is there a purpose as to why you're doing what you're doing? Do you have a plan? Do you have a vision? Do you control your phone or are you controlled by your phone? Let's be honest. <laughs> like, are you a slave to your phone? And that's strong language. But seriously, like, can you just not control it? Do you uncontrollably find yourself scrolling and scrolling and scrolling for hours? And you're like, what am I doing with my life, right? Like at times, that's what we think about. And honestly, I've read uh, uh, some books on y'all's generation, like some older generations, when it comes to our phones, we're like, something's wrong here. But Generation Z's kind of grown up with it. And for a lot of us, we're like, what's the big deal? I'm on my phone six hours a day, eight hours a day. I'm scrolling through this. I'm scrolling through that. What's the big Deal. And I want to make it no, tonight, not so much, but this, this series, we're going to talk about some good things with your phone. I'm not going to act like this is evil, okay? Humanity's been able to use technology for thousands upon thousands of years to make an impact in the kingdom of God, right? It, it shouldn't be any different with this. But let's make no mistake about it. This is powerful. It has the power to bring about some, some harm. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to kind of share a story with you, but before I do that, I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to pray one more time for the next three weeks um, that these aren't just kind of fun moments, but honestly, that these would kind of transform the way that we think about some of this stuff. If you guys would pray with me. Uh, Father, I pray for the middle schooler in the room, for the high schooler in the room, uh, courage and their bravery. Uh, I thank you for it, for the fact that they're here and God, pray for even more, for them to invite friends, to get people up here next week, to join in on this conversation that has a whole lot of weight to it. Father, I pray that you guide these words. I pray that you guide these moments. I pray that you guide our attention spans. I pray that you help us zone in. I pray that you help us stay off of our phones as we're talking about our phones during the sermon. And I pray that, um, that we can at least begin a discussion that might change the way we think about it and, and maybe, maybe help us put a plan of action in place as to how we can use it for, for the good of those around us, for our good and for your glory most importantly. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I was down in Atlanta this week. I took a class on the Bible um, for a few days, and it was awesome. Some of my favorite days in a long time. Uh, before The day before the class started, I went and played golf, and I didn't know the professor. I didn't exactly know what the class was all about. Um, and so I hate to admit it, but honestly, what I was most excited about down in Atlanta was I was going to go to the Atlanta Hawks versus the uh, Houston Rockets game. It was going to be awesome. Uh, any NBA fans out there? Um, see you. And, uh, and so I was all excited. I was going to watch Trey Young. I was going to watch James Harden. I was, I was fired up. I was all excited. And so I'm there with Cody Marsh, Matt, one of Matt's friends, and we get on the MARTA, public transportation. We go down to the State Farm Arena, and we had one purpose. It was to get in the game, get a decent seat. That was it. We just wanted to watch the game. And that was, that was the goal. That was the purpose. That was why we were there. 
but we didn't have a ticket yet. And so we, 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 there were a bunch of tickets available online. There was the box office right there for us to buy tickets. But Matt's like, let's just scalp some tickets on the sidewalk. And we've done this a bunch in St. Louis for different games. And Matt's the master negotiator. He's, he's kind of a wild man. And, uh, and so we're like, Matt, you lead the way. And so we get there and these guys are like, $100 a ticket, lower bowl, $100 a ticket, lower bowl. We brought 240 bucks. Each of us were willing to spend $60. We were going to splurge. We don't get to go to very many NBA games. And so Matt's like, nope, too much, too much. So he's turning guys down. Guys are starting to get angry. Like, what in the world? And then we meet our guy, Big Mike. Okay. We meet Big Mike. And Big Mike has $239 tickets in the lower bowl. And he's like, $100 a piece. It's like five, 10 minutes before the game starts. He's like, $100 a piece. Matt's like, $40 a piece. And he said, $80 a piece. And Matt, I think, got a little cocky. You know, we had $240. And he's like, I'll give you two twenty, fifty-five dollars a piece, right? Like, like you couldn't do two forty, Matt. But he's just like wanting to prove a point that he's the master negotiator. And the guy's like, nope. And Matt's like, the game's about to start. You aren't going to sell these tickets. You aren't going to sell them. You're going to—they're going to go to waste. You aren't going to get money. Come on, sell them. He's like, done, done. Two hundred twenty bucks. And so we're all excited. I'm like hitting Matt's butt. I'm like, come on, baby. You know, we're fired up. We're going into the State Farm Arena. We're all excited. And we get up to where we scan the tickets. And I scan it. And it says, beep, see box office. And then Matt scans his, beep, see box office. Cody scans his, beep, see box office. Nobody else's ticket is doing this. And I'm like, oh, no. So we go and we go to the box office. And the lady says, where'd you get your ticket? I said, we got our ticket from Big Mike. That's where we got our ticket. Where was Big Mike at? Big Mike was on the sidewalk. And she's like, okay, I would be really surprised if this was, this was a real ticket. And she calls her boss over. Boss looks at the ticket. Yeah, that's fake. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't sell those tickets. And so I'm like, let's go find Big Mike, right? Sounds like a great idea. We're in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. You know, we, this is not where I'm from. Let's go find the guy who sold us fake tickets. And so we go on this pursuit of Big Mike and there's all these scalpers and we're like, where's Big Mike? Where's Big Mike? He sold us fake tickets. Everybody's like, you should have bought them from us. You know, they're angry. They're not going to help us find Big Mike. And so we don't end up finding Big Mike. We're trying to negotiate with other guys to give us like a $10 ticket. All that said, we end up going back to the box office. There was a guy who, who, was all the way, who was in all the way from Mexico, got scammed by Big Mike as well, okay? And so Matt brings Big Mike and myself up to the box office, and Matt, again, is the master negotiator. He's like, he came all the way from Mexico, came from St. Louis. Can you just let us in, right? It's like, go standing room only. And the lady's like, no. Essentially, her message was, is, that's not the way you're supposed to buy tickets, and we didn't get in the game, right? Like our desire that we had, the reason we were there, is it, it was unfulfilled. Let's, let's be real. It was unfulfilled. Guess what? James Harden had a 41-point triple-double. Trey Young had a 43-point triple-double, and we missed it. Our desire went completely unfulfilled fulfilled why we went about it in the complete wrong way. And here's the reality. We have a lot of desires. We can throw that list up on the screen. Hope. I think we all share these. Love. Companionship with people. Connection with God. Peace. Purpose. Meaning. Eternal significance where you're like, you know, playing part in something that's bigger than your self. I don't think the desires are the issue. I think the issue is, is the way that we go about trying to get them. I think that's the issue. And the reality is, is just like, you know, again, if we just bought the tickets the way we were told, like anyone wise would have told us not to do what we did. If we would have gone that way, we would have gotten in the game. And for many of us, we say, you know, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to take the easy way. I'm going to take the cheap way. I'm going to take the counterfeit way. And when you go the way that is opposite of the way that God would call you to go, your desires will never be fulfilled. They won't. And so hear me on this. I don't know who this is for. We aren't even really talking about our phones. Okay. Hear me. If, if, if you have a desire in your heart that's unfulfilled, and you're tempted right now 
to try and go about it, to try and attain it in a way that is contrary to the way that God would tell you to, please don't. Turn the other way. Don't bow to the temptation. Have a conversation about it. Confess it. Talk to your small group leader about it. Don't. Don't. High school student, if you, had, if you have a God-given desire for companionship and friendship and acceptance and whatever it is, please do not, please do not try and attain that by dating someone you are not supposed to date. Please don't do it. It will leave a wake of regret and shame. If, if you long for approval or whatever it is, if you have these different desires, please do not try to attain it by you know, going against your values just where you can fit in. Don't do it. It's not worth it. What is it for you? Are you tempted to go about, like, like do you want hope? Is there, is there a long, don't try and find hope in a, in a worldly narrative that, that just doesn't have the weight to actually give you the hope that, that God, the message of Jesus could give to you. If you want meaning, significance, don't sell out to something that, that is just a worldly temporary thing. Don't, it's not worth it. And for many of us, we try and find like, like, like the fulfillment of our desires, if we're being real, in this. We do, we do. Is there any way we could get those slides up on the back to where I can see what's next? If not, no big deal. I can kind of go back and forth to my computer. But if we could do that, that would be great. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. And for many of us, here's what we're going to talk about, okay? One of them is community. One of them is community. We desire community. We desire friendship. We desire real face-to-face -face friendship. And I think a lot of times we forfeit it. We forfeit real, true, lasting friendships, community, on the altar of our phones. And here's the deal, we can't do it. You get one chance at middle school. You get one chance at high school. And for many of us, again, we forfeit our purpose in these seasons on the altar of our phone and a lot of times community. This God-given desire to be connected to people is gone. There was a story that went viral of a man who, 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 who tapped a homeless guy on the shoulder who was kind of asleep, gave him 20 bucks. The homeless guy said, stay here, keep my stuff goes, buys two lunches with the $20, comes back and says, here's a lunch for you, here's a lunch for me. I just get really lonely out here. It went viral. You know why? You know why it, it, it struck the hearts of the country and the world? Because we know something. We're wired for relationship. We're wired for community. We're wired to be connected with one another we are. Jesus knew this. Jesus talked about it. The New Testament, the writers of the New Testament know this. There are, there's like dozens upon dozens of one another statements in the, in, the, in, in the New Testament. Love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, lay your life down for one another. All these different, rebuke one another, challenge one, confess your sins to one another. All these different things. Do you know the implication for that? We're doing life with one another. We're... We're doing life with one another, right? And for many of us, that's just not really the case. But when we are, this is what it is. It's a picture. It's a picture of Jesus to the world. It is. When we're in relationship with one another, Jesus says, by the way that you love one another, the people will come to know, the people will come to know that you're my disciples. It's so important. It's so crucial. Your friendships with one another, maybe your friendship that you have with the person sitting next to you is massive in the story of our God. It is. Here's a story. I'm not going to pick on you, but I'm going to kind of pick on you for a second. It was this summer. It was a squad meeting. A lot of you are in the room, and you guys might remember this, but we were having a meeting in that room, and there were like 13 people that walked in, give or take. And I said hello to everyone who walked in. Nobody else said hi to each other. You guys, if you're in the room, you liked each other, at least I think, right? Like, we got, we got along for the most part, I think, this summer. There were a few issues, but that's okay. Um, like, we, we liked one another. And I remember vocally, vocally, I said, I said, do you ever say hi? Do you guys say hi to each other? Do you, do you say hello? And a lot of us were like, 
No. Not, not really. We don't really say, hi, it's, it's, a, it's a safety net. It is. It's a safety net when we get into a social setting. In fact, we get our phones out that should be used to connect with people, but we use them to dodge connecting with people. It's so interesting. Am I the only one who gets on an elevator and then there are other people on there and I'm like, I have nothing to do, but I'm like, sometimes it's just like my home screen. Am I the only one? Am I the only one when I go to a social setting that's like waiting or a restaurant or something that's waiting for like my best friend or the person who I'm there with? I'm just like, guys, am I the only one who goes to the urinal? <laughs> and if someone's standing next to me, I'm like... I don't want to have to say hi. Get out my phone. It's interesting, right? It's very weird, right? Here's the, here's the deal. Here's the deal, okay? Isolation. Isolation is both the promise and the price of technologi- technological advance. The problem is that we invite loneliness, even though it makes us miserable, The history of our use of technology is is a history of isolation that's wanted and achieved. It's true. We isolate ourselves from the world. Guys, we shouldn't isolate ourselves from anybody, okay? Like the New Testament call isn't just to love your best friends, talk to your best friends, but every person you come eyeball to eyeball with is made in the image of God. You're to love them. You are, but let's, t- let's make it even more personal. For many of us, for many of you guys, your best friends, you get in the car. We get in the car and we don't talk because we're on our phones. Our best friends, our family, those that we love most, our relationships at time hang in the balance. And again, they're kind of thrown on the altar of our phones. And I know the counter argument to this. I know this. Again, I told you this is really practical. I think it's helpful stuff. It comes from a book. I hope that you bring your friends next week. But here's the counter argument that maybe you make. My relationships are really good online. Snapchat's good. I'm building friendship. I'm building friendship on Instagram. I'm building friendship through text or whatever it is. I don't even know if y'all text, but I'm building friendships with this, right? I'm being real. There are real relationships on this device. There's a sociologist, psychologist that, that says this. I think this is so important for us to know. No amount of commitment to being completely real online will overcome humanity's lack of complete integrity. In other words, no matter how hard you try to be real and authentic online, you will always fall short. Your image online, the image that you portray online in your social media accounts, to some extent, you might be more real than others, but to some extent, it will always be filtered. But here's the deal. Your deepest desire to be loved will never be fulfilled in somebody loving a filtered version of you. It won't. You do not, you don't desire people to love the fake version of you. You desire people to love the real you. We have desires. I believe one of them is for community, for companionship with other people. And here's the deal. It, it, it won't be attained through your phone. It won't be. And then be, so, so honestly, your, your desire hangs in the balance here, in my opinion, if we aren't careful. And then beyond that, beyond that, do you remember when I said that our relationships with one another are to point people to our Savior? Francis Chan says this. He's actually talking to parents, but take it into our context. Parents, you can wrestle with this for a moment. I meet more and more kids that legitimately don't know how to talk to people and who don't want to look up from their screens. 
We are to be raising soldiers. We're raising missionaries. We're raising kids who are to go out into their worlds, into their schools, into their spheres of influence, to share the love and the message of Jesus with everyone they come into contact with. Guys, I'm gonna be honest with you, okay? If I've been on my phone for a long time, okay, it takes me a while to like not be real awkward in social settings. Could I, could I say this? I think these are making us a little more awkward. Conversations are getting more difficult. Looking people in the eye is really difficult, but if we're to love people, share the love of Jesus, invite people to church, we gotta know how to talk to people. And I think if we aren't careful, this, this can make it pretty difficult. The implication with what I just said is this. If your desire for community is unfulfilled, your mission will be too. It will be. If you aren't connecting with the world around you and loving people the way that God has called you to love people, I am speaking to myself, friends. Let me share this. Here's some authenticity, okay? I said, social media fast this January. No social media, nothing, okay? I kind of help run our student account, okay? And so I've gotten on there a couple times to post, and then I'm like, it's fine, I'll just delete it afterwards. I haven't deleted it right afterwards. Log into the Josh Nobbled account, scroll for a little bit, delete it again, and then I'm like, you know, I'm not doing what I said I was gonna do. It's a, it's a big deal, okay? The next thing, and this is gonna sound like it's, it's, it's contradicting what I just said, but the next thing that we forfeit at times on the altar of our phone is isolation is isolation. You just, you just said that our phones isolate us. Yes, that's, that's true. It, it is. But there's another thing that's true, and I'm talking about two different types of isolation here. Isolation from the world should lead to connection with God. We, we all have a desire. Jesus shows us this in the Gospels as he retreats. He isolates himself from what's going on around him to where he can be with his heavenly father to where he can hear from God, to where he can pray, to where he can do these different things. Another way we could put it is this. We all have a desire to be still. We all have a desire to be still and know that he is God, that he's good, that he's in control of my life and the affairs of our whole world. But the problem is, the problem is this. Our phones at times can be a double-edged sword because our phones isolate us, but when we're isolated, we can never be still. When we isolate ourselves, when we're in our rooms, when, when we want to be still, when our mind needs to be still, our soul desires that we can't. There are so many things going on in our minds, like I got Snapchat to check, I got Instagram, who's liking my picture? I wonder if I should delete that story. I wonder if I should do all these different things. Was, are people gonna judge me because of that TikTok video that I just posted? All these different things. Leaders, we're thinking what's going on in the news. I gotta check it, I gotta be in the loop. I can't be irrelevant in conversations with other people. I gotta check it, I gotta check it, I gotta check it. It. And so, listen, it, 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 our phones cause us to be disconnected when we are to be connected with the world, but our phones also cause us to be distracted by the world while we are to be disconnecting from the world. So this is just something to think about. Isolation, this is, this is how one of the writers puts it, isolation plus feeding on vanity, another way is just, again, checking your phone, the rat race of social media and your image and all these different things, that equals soul-starving loneliness. But isolation plus communion with God equals soul-feeding solitude. Something that we're designed for. Something that, if you're being honest, you desire. You desire at times for life just to slow down in the presence of God. I know I do. Guys, every year we go to Big Stuff, we have quiet time. Every year when we have surveys and have conversations about what your favorite thing at Big Stuff is, do you know what a lot of you say? Quiet time. Quiet time. I like sitting there. I like reading my Bible. I like listening to worship music. I like being still for 45 minutes. If we love it so much, if we love spending time with God, if we love being Still, if we love reflecting on our relationship with Jesus, why at times is it so hard to do? 
the author of the book that I'm reading really gives six reasons why, okay? And it's that social media, in one sense, and our phone, in one sense, is information candy, okay? Some of the language he uses, okay? Again, if you're an adult in the room, if you're a, a, a leader in the room, okay, we just, there's like this pride that must, we just got to be informed. <laughs> we got to be informed what's going on, which good luck with being accurately informed <laughs> with what's going on in the affairs of our world today. But we're like, I got to be informed. I got to be informed. I got to be informed. I got to see what's going on. I got to know what's going on. I got to do this, that, the other. I can't be irrelevant in social situations when politics get brought up, when all these different things get brought up. You just got to be in the know. And then for Maybe that's not you, but for students, maybe you're like, I got to be in the know on what's going on in my Instagram account. I got to know what's going on with the stories. I got to know what's going on on Snapchat. I can't be irrelevant in conversations at school. I got to see what's going on. Next, I think this might be the biggest one. It's ego candy. We are obsessed with ourselves, and we want to know what people are saying about us. Who's liking it? Who's commenting? Who's not liking it? Who's not commenting? What's going on? Who's following me? Is this boy Snapchatting me? Is this girl Snapchatting me? What is, what's going on? There's, there's ego candy. We gotta, we gotta sustain this image. We gotta sustain this image on our social media accounts. Next, it's entertainment candy. It's just entertaining. There's so much stuff going on and I gotta be entertained. I gotta have something in front of me. I gotta have these flashing lights. I gotta have these basketball highlights. I gotta see the scores. I gotta watch the TikTok videos. I constantly need to be entertained, okay? I sent over the wrong word for this next one, but, but a lot of it is it's boredom, avoid, it's bo it's boredom avoidance. We, we, we can never be bored. And for a lot of us, it's like, if we're being honest, black words on a white page just have a hard time competing with this stuff. Having conversations with your parents in your living room, if you're being honest, it's just like, it's just kind of boring compared to what else I could be doing. We got we, we to avoid boredom at all costs. Next, it's responsibility avoidance. For me, a lot of times this is it. We have tasks that we need to carry out and we have homework that we need to do and we have all these different things and maybe there's a tough conversation that we know that we need to have and we need to take care of our responsibilities, but we're like, no, 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 no. This is, this is, this is gonna kind of help me stall and procrastinate. Next, it's hardship avoidance. There's pain and you're not happy with your life or maybe with who you are in the moment. Maybe a tough situation at home. Maybe a tough dynamic with your friends. And let's be real. For a lot of us, this is the escape. This is how we avoid it. But this is a fake. This is a counterfeit. And it does not compare to our Savior. Your desire, your desire for connecting with people if you try and find it in your phone, you won't. You desire isolation from the world. And if you try to find it in your phone, you won't. You won't. And so what do we do with this? Practically, where, where do we take this? Would anybody agree with any of the stuff that's being said? Would we, would we agree with some of it? I don't want to just give you the problem, <laughs> right? Like a lot of the book, I'm, I'm going to be honest, is that social media can be a really big problem. There are some solutions. And so here are just a couple practical things that we're going to close with. It's going to take a couple minutes and we'll talk about them in small groups. And the first thing that I just want to challenge you to do this week, a okay, small step, not telling you to throw your phone in, your, in, in the garbage. Not, first thing is this. Encourage people in person tomorrow. Just take a step at encouraging people in your life face-to-face. -face. Like, start with saying hi. Every person you see in the hall that you would be like, I should probably say hi to them. It might be weird saying hi to every student you see in the hallway. But smile at everyone you look at when you make eye contact with them. Encourage people in person.
tell them they are cool and awesome, whatever. I don't know. You get it. Just encourage people. Nobody will ever, ever, ever complain about being encouraged, ever. I promise you that. And I think you're going to come to know that, wow, this is cool. This is neat. This is good. There's a reason that the Apostle Paul says, hey, as long as today is called today, which when is today not called today? Never. He says, encourage one another. Next, this one's a bigger challenge. Start your day with God. Start your, start your day with God. And maybe start out small. I'm not acting like this has to be 30 minutes. Here's a bigger challenge. We're going to talk about more of this stuff the third week. You got to be back during the panel. But leave this out of your room when you go to bed. Don't, don't put it on your bed. Maybe go put it on your dresser because I know what the temptation is to do when you wake up. What is it? Let's check what's on Instagram. Let's check what's on this. Let's check what's on that. I feel it. I'm there. I'm with you. Start your day with God. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. Hear me on this, okay? We're going to go back to live at nine videos, okay, fam, on our Instagram. Our leaders are going to be leading devotionals, and we're just going to go through the Gospel of John together. So tomorrow morning, just start reading John chapter 1. Read John chapter 1 and say a prayer that God could help you. That's it. Just read John chapter 1 and pray tomorrow morning. Do the same thing on Tuesday. Do the same thing on Wednesday. Start your day with, start your day with God. Okay, I'm going to close with a story. Okay, so it was, you remember the Atlanta Hawks game story. The illustration was is that when you try and attain your desires in a way that you weren't supposed to, you're never going to fulfill them. Okay, so after after realized we weren't going to be able to get into the game, we, we remembered that Duke was playing against Georgia Tech, like a mile and a half down the road. And so Matt, <laughs> Matt was like, let's hop on scooters. He's like, you know what, I'll make it up to you guys. It's kind of my fault. It was my idea. Let's just buy nosebleed tickets. Let's sit up really high. Let's go to sold out Georgia Tech versus Duke game. And so we get on our phones. We do it the right way. We buy tickets, okay? We get the tickets. And we go into the game, we're sitting at the very top, okay, we're sitting at the very top, kind of cool, Charles Barkley walks up and he's sitting in the nosebleeds, like right by us, we're like, that's weird, wonder why I didn't have a front row seat, it's from a box or something, but how many of you guys know who Charles Barkley is? Okay, that's cool, a few of you. Um, and, and I'm like, this is, this is neat. And so then we're looking around, and Matt, again, is kind of a wild man, and he's, he's, he has a little more guts than I do, and he's like, there are some seats open in the front row. There are some seat, seats open in the front row. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, but those aren't our seats, you know? And, and like, besides, there's a security guard right there, and there's no way that against Duke versus Georgia Tech, we're going to be able to get down to the front row. He's like, what's the worst they can say? Go back to your seat, right? He's like, let's try it. And so we walk all the way down. One of the guys backed out, so it's just three of us. And... And we, we walk down, and we're walking down, like, you know, all the stairs to get down to the floor. And I'm, like, stopping. I'm getting really nervous. I literally stop. I go over to the left side of the aisle, and the guy behind me who's with us, he's like, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. I'm like, okay, I'll keep going. So I keep going, and we get down to the front row, and the security guard's looking the other way. And, and he's looking the other way, and we just slide right into these seats. And I'm trying not to make eye contact, and I'm all nervous, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? And, and Matt, I think they're nervous, too. Like, what's this front row of the Duke game? We're right behind the bench. Grant Hill, another guy you don't care about, is like five seats from us. And, and so, so we're, <laughs> we're sitting there, and then all of a sudden, I realize this is going to work. This is, like, again, the desire was to go in the game, but... Man, we got a whole lot more than what we than what we desired, and so we're sitting there, we're, we're watching the game, and and Georgia Tech six and seven, Duke's like the best team in the country. Georgia Tech finds themselves up one point with four minutes left. You know what's going on now? I'm high fiving the security guard. I'm like, come on! I'm making friends with the security guard. We're in. We are in. We got way more than what we expected. And here's what here's what I want us to understand. And it might be a little bit of a stretch because we did cheat to get those seats. But hear me on this, okay? When you pursue your desires the way that God calls you to, you always get more than what you came for. 
Jesus makes this promise over and over and over again. I will give you, I will give you living water. You will be overflowing. I will give you life and life to the what? Full. It is going to be far more than you could ever possibly imagine. If you do life the way that I tell you to do life, you will. So hear me on this, okay? What counterfeit are you giving your life to? What is it? How are you approaching this? How are you approaching your life? Are you living life the way that Jesus calls you to? Are you spending any time with him? Are you thinking about him? Are you loving people? Are you developing relationships? Are you carrying out the life that God has called you to live? Because if you do, the desires that we talked about at the very beginning, they won't just be met, but they will be blown out of the water. Somebody say amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you, and we are really grateful for who you are and for that truth. You are bigger, you are better, you are greater than anything that we could possibly imagine. You are. You love us, you care for us, you died for us. You rose from the dead victorious over sin and death. And God, that's really good news. But Father, you didn't just come so that we could go to heaven one day. Father, you, you, you said that we should pray that heaven would come down to here, that heaven would invade our lives and, and our earth and our world and the world around us. But God, there are some ways that we need to go about attaining these desires and these promises that you have for us. And so Father, guide the conversations that we have when we go to small groups. Father, help us celebrate the reality that you are bigger. You're, you're better. You're greater. We can rest in you. We need to isolate. We need to retreat. We need to be with you because when we do, we always get more than what we came for. God, this is a tough issue. It's difficult. And there might even be some more difficult conversations moving ahead. So we need your help. We need your help with this. We need your power with this. So invade our hearts, invade our lives. Father, help us welcome you in, in the area of our phones. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and let's sing this song together.